This is episode 6 of the weekly J in this video, life will take its first steps on land, and there will be others of two. If you haven't seen the episodes before this one, feel free to click the playlist in the description. There's a higher quality image of the cladogram in the description. The northern island on Tanis is named Boner Island because funny, and for reasons you will see later on, in the video, ITS related to bones. And the southern island of Tanis is now formerly known as Shitas, thanks to typical Insmith resident for winning the vote. The greater Plurum tree or Peninsula Predisermis runix meaning brush tree with branching roots evolves from Plurum tree they are 40 to 60 centimeters tall with the extinction of the mats, thus further opening up more sediment for colonization, learn tree population simply exploded which in turn meant individuals were competing for space and LGIHT. Over time, some would adapt to grow larger than their contemporaries in the race towards Sid Light which in turn led to the evolution of the greater Palerm tree, which has made several adaptations toward gigantism. Now, the greater Palerm trees still retain many ancestral characteristics like the fact they have modal larvae that will get a good amount of energy from detritus and plankton alongside photosynthesis as they seek out a spot to plant their rear ends into to subsequently mature in their adult form. Adult greater Palerm trees still rely a great deal upon photosynthesis for energy, though. They have turned the hairs on the first segment into feeding tendrils lined with cilia, which strain the water for detritus and any plankton to then be ingested. The roots of their ancestor have become much more defined than the adults, having developed basic branching to better anchor them within the sediment. This better anchoring system is part of the reason why this species was able to grow taller than their ancestor, which in turn means they can better reach light and thrive in crowded ecosystems. While the greater Plurum trees have made some changes for their larger size, their reproduction has hardly changed, with the greater Plurum trees releasing specialized gamete-like cells from their skin that then drift about in the water currents. When they meet other gamete-like cells from another individual, they fuse together and develop into a new larval greater Plurum tree. The, the title Plurum stunk or Vermibretus literalis meaning worm tree of the beach, evolves from the Plurum tree they are 4 to 5 centimeters tall. As Plurum tree numbers went up, they faced competition for space and light. While some groups adapted to these pressures by getting bigger, others instead started to grow closer and closer to the shorelines of the two islands found upon the planet. Here, they had to face the tide going out and desiccating, which in turn resulted in them developing several adaptations to better live in this area. Over time, these colonists would become the tidal plurum stock, one of the first organisms on the planet since the mass extinction to re-colonize the land in any capacity. At a casual glance, one may think this species is pretty similar to their ancestor, their larvae being strictly aquatic and swimming about in the shallows. These larvae still take indetritus and plankton with their cilia-derived hairs, but they primarily rely upon photosynthesis for energy. One major difference from the larvae of their ancestor and close cousins is that the tidal plurum stock possess thicker skin, which does provide some protection against them scraping against the sediment when being caught in waves and being bashed against the seabed. Its primary purpose, however, only comes into play once. These larvae develop an important adaptation, spiracles. Located upon the second segment, these spiracles actively pump in and out water, providing better respiration for these larvae and allowing them to survive out of water. This is the point where the tidal plurum stunt larvae will seek out an ideal spot within the sediment and plant their rear ends into the sand to mature. While the tidal plurum stunts can survive being on dry land, they still rely on the water in several ways. While the adults do still need to be rehydrated every 6 hours or so, their reproduction is still 100% tied to the water. This is because the tidal plurum stock still releases specialized gamete-like cells from their skin that then drift about in the water currents. When they meet other gamete-like cells from another individual, they fuse together and develop into a new tidal plurum stock in the form of the larvae. These gametes dry out if exposed to and can t be carried by air currents, while the larvae can t breath or until they are about to mature and thus would suffocate on land. These features of tidal plurum stock, alongside the lack of support of their bodies out of water and the fact they still dry out if exposed to the air for too long, restrict the species to the intertidal zones of the islands and thus still leave the inland areas completely barren. The donor plurum tree evolves from the tidal plurum stock. 
the donor plurum tree inhabits the northernmost island of Janus. It is now fully terrestrial instead of intertidal. The first adaptation to live on land is its bones. They no longer are lump on land and can actually fight against gravity with this new support structure. This skeletal system is made of a similar material to wood on Earth but it is stronger. In the larvae the bones are similar in appearance to spines on Earth but their skeleton is much more flexible. This fuses when they mature for better strength but lower mobility but they don't move when they are adults. Second adaptation is their respiration. Therefore, sparkles are now capable of breathing air and have muscles that move them like lungs. They also have hearts to pump nutrients up throughout the tall body. Third adaptation is their roots. Since they aren't in the water anymore they need other maids to get water. They do this by collecting water from the ground with their roots. Fourth slash fifth adaptation is the largest form of locomotion and diet. Instead of swimming, it uses modified flagellum to crawl across the land to find detritus to eat. Next adaptation is their life cycle. The gametes are lighter so they can stay in the air longer. Most hit the floor and die quickly but some become larvae which will eat their dead brethren and photosynthesize until they are big enough to plant their flagella into the ground. Plus or necrocampus asar meaning dead body eater, evolved from the cutter bugs. They are surprisingly the first motile organism that primarily or entirely eats dead bodies. They smell with their antennae that are longer and have more compact olfactory nerves to smell corpses from long distances. They can smell a dead body from about 100 meters away. They rip off flesh with their claws and put it in their mouths using their antenna. They do not eat the bones but they do occasionally nibble on them. They have a hard time getting through exoskeletons so they usually enter the body underneath the shell via the eyes or any orifice. They have shrunken in size. The skeletal wheat fish may look much different than the bony wheat fish but it really isn't. It only looks that way because the entire bony wheat fish population was morbidly a beast. They have very little fat in their bodies. All of these new adaptations are because the mat is gone. There is still plenty of food but there is this thing called sand that isn't very nutritious so they may or may not have needed to adapt to detect if they are eating food or not. They can taste food with their feet before they eat it and if it isn't food then they, they don't put it in their mouth. And they keep crawling. They don't just leave PLAMTS. They also eat dead bodies, alive bodies, eggs and 1 16th skeletal wheat fish have done at least one act of cannibalism in their lifetime. Their skin is pale because green isn't a good color to camouflage against sand. Still, watchers evolved from the boots. BTW the hairy backs are now officially called boots whether you like it or not. They have the same gist as the skeletal wheat fish. They aren't fat anymore and don't camouflage against the mat. As you may have noticed, they have an eye. This singular eye has its own ganglia of nerves at the base of the arm. This eye detects food. If they see green, they go towards it, if they don't then they keep walking in the direction they were already walking in until they sleep or find more food. They can look straight into the eyes of an approaching cutting bug but if they don't hear slash feel it coming they won't react because the eye isn't good enough. Their tentacles in their foot are inside of the foot in the image but they can come out whenever they need to grab food. Sticky hole plurum evolved from plurum trees. They haven't changed very noticeably from their ancestors aside from the strange indent on the tip of the plurm. Their ancestors used to just release gametes from everywhere but these plurm have evolved to concentrate it to a single area. This is beneficial because it spends less energy every time it releases gametes meaning it can release more often. The gametes are released at a higher place on their body so that they drift longer instead of being released into the sand. Because of this concave head, the gametes get concentrated and when they release gametes it looks like the aftermath of dropping something into water. Inter intertidal boots evolved from stilt watchers. They have evolved to move into shallower waters due to lack of food. They mainly subsist off of intertidal plurum but some live in slightly deeper waters and they eat plimounds and other species of plurum trees. Their gills are internalized now and are in a body cavity. This cavity is built to keep water in when going out of water because they can sometimes be washed onto land during low tide. They can survive for about 31 hours out of land before dying of desiccation and lack of oxygen. Intertidal boots are smaller to combat the occasional gravity of land. The crushing slugs evolved from slugs. Their digestive system is asymmetrical, 
Their right filter is smaller than the left one and they have an asymmetric butt tunnel. They no longer consume food and expel waste out of the same hole now because they have a butt hole that most individuals have to the right of the mouth hole but 0.01% have it on their left. They have a new diet composed mostly of bones. When they find a dead body they will either eat the exoskeleton but not claws because they don't taste good, or they will eat first claws to eat to flesh until bone is visible, or they will eat the baleen of Yamatha. As you may have noticed by what I said earlier about how they consume boof corpses, crunching slaws work alongside slaws. Crushing slaws and slaws swim together in packs of around 6 to 20 individuals with usually more slaws than crushing slaws. Crushing slaws are bigger than their ancestors and now teammates and they have powerful dawn muscles to crush bones. They don't have as good as a sense of smell but they don't need it since they follow slaws which do have good smell. If a predator attacked the pack, crushing slaws will open their jaws wide and face the predators. If the predators attack then the crushing slaws will bite them and slaws who are full may also help by slashing and cutting the predator until they leave. The the Shitas Plurmstock evolves from Tidal Plurmstock. They have thick skin to not dry out and they have wooden interiors when they are adults. They are larger than their ancestors but species of this clade will become larger than this primal clade shown. Adults excrete spore-like gametes from their skin. When two spores from different parents make contact they fuse with each other and start to begin growing. Spores, as we will call them are very small and difficult to see with the naked eye. They are very round in shape unlike their older forms. They photosynthesize while in the air. Their flagella are wider and act like tiny little wings to glide. They can flap the wings but it takes a lot of energy for them and they don't get very far. Once they feel pressure, they have landed on the ground. They will begin to change into a new form. The plurn larger it around and crawl around with their awkward flagella, eating detritus until they have found a good spot to grow and they have enough food. Southern Island Plurm trees have a woody inside similar to our trees. Their flagella they had when they were plurms have been repurposed to be used as leaves. Their leaves aren't symmetrical to take up as much light as possible. Sand stalkers evolved from kissing plurm. Sand stalkers are a clade of plurm that evolved to live in a diurnal lifestyle. Their flagella on their first segment have changed. Their top pair have become longer and more sensitive to touch. Their bottom pair have become stronger and have sharp points at the end of them to kill prey. They bury themselves in the sand until they feel something brush up against their whiskers. They will then lunge out of the sand and stab its prey while biting it. It doesn't have any teeth so the biting doesn't do any damage but it helps it hold onto its prey that is usually larger than it. Le Lean drinkers evolved from the sand stalkers. Their name is pretty self-explanatory. They feed by drinking the blood of larger organisms. Their oral groove has a larger cavity for fitting more lean. Their oral groove isn't just used for drinking lean but can also be used as a suction or clamping device to stay attached to host. They usually don't stay on one prey very long as to not kill it and to excrete fecal matter. When they are born, they live similar to a worm until they detect something above them. After their first host, they will look for prey instead of hide. They will have many ancestors but they will look very similar and their descriptions would be three sentences max which would be pretty boring and a waste of time. I'm just gonna list some descendants real quickly. Tiny, long and flat ones that can't go under exoskeletons. Of cut or bike species. Bigger ones with very long and sharp tentacles to drink the blood of Yamatha. Ones that have thick, wrinkly skin to survive on land for a while before their intertidal prey goes back in the water. If you like that and want to see more then like the video and subscribe to the channel. Comment any constructive criticism or anything you liked about the video. It really does help.